episode 20 of the 99 Forever podcast. I'm Eric Friesen, and joining me on the show tonight is Below the Ice writer Liam Horobin. Liam, what's going on tonight? Good, man. How are you doing? Not too bad. You know, it's just at this time of year, you're used to hockey being going on, and looks like we're still a couple months away from seeing any type of major junior or NHL action, at least. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of weird times. I know a lot of leagues are trying to fit in some, like, cohort exhibition games. So hopefully those can start going well for everybody and we can get some seasons going here pretty quick. Yeah, I'm starting to think the first, other than the Quebec League getting going for a short while, and I don't know how their season is going to proceed, but it looks like the, the first big hockey event we'll be watching will, will be the World Junior Tournament in Edmonton at in, uh, I think they're starting on Christmas Day, they've decided now. Yeah, that looks like a, it's a pretty good time to start. I mean, usually it's Boxing Day, so one day ahead yeah. it makes, makes a big difference. And who knows, maybe even for other sports, like NBA might start that day too. So Christmas could be a, a very good day all around, even though it usually is. But that could be a little added bonus for everybody, for sure. Definitely. And, and I guess the other thing with the Oilers is uh, they probably won't be starting until at least the tournament's finished in early January or else they'd be starting on the road although we don't have a concrete date on when the NHL is actually planning to get going here yeah like who, who really knows what's going to happen there right I know there's a lot of a lot of talk going on but hopefully sometime in January we can start seeing some Oilers hockey again since we didn't quite to see the get to see them as much <laughs> as we wanted to when it started but it is what it is, so yeah, hopefully all that stuff can get going in, in January sometime. Yeah. yeah, it seemed like just kind of a tease almost, because we went four and a half months without NHL hockey, and then you get the Oilers back for literally one week, and after that, we're looking at another four months, so it's basically two off-seasons sandwiched together with just one week of hockey in between, so this almost reminds me of the lockout year in either 2004 or 2012. Yeah, it was uh, it was kind of a bit of a tease. That's a good way to put it. I mean, yeah. I remember watching that first game when they played Chicago, and I was so hyped for them because that was, I believe, that was a Saturday game, right? They were one of the first games. Yeah, they were yeah. Saturday at one p.m. So they they might have actually been the first game. Yeah, I, so I just remember like, being at home, like my dry saddle jersey on. My dad came <laughs> home from work and early, and we were watching the game, and he went back to work before the third period size. So yeah, can pretty much assume how that went. If you oh, don't know the score, yeah, it was a it was a frustrating one. But you know the, I think the thing that uh, really was tough for Oilers fans is that their top guys were so phenomenal in that series. I mean, even two weeks after the Oilers were eliminated from the playoffs, McDavid was still top ten in playoff scoring. Like they did everything they could to get the team over the hump. It's just they if they would have got even average goaltending, I think they beat the Blackhawks in that series. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I think just some of the things that happened in the series too, like even the dry sidle, Yamamoto, Nugent Hopkins line not being put oh. together. And when they did go together for the last seven minutes of game four, yeah. they, were, they were unreal to watch. And it's just like, man, if that was just something you did, like even in, like you test it, after game game one or period one or whatever, you're like, hey, this isn't working. We're down four one or whatever the score was. You throw them together, and it's a, it seems like it could have been a totally different series, but obviously that wasn't the case. But yeah, I mean, the top guys showed up for the Oilers offensively anyway, and I know there was a lot of criticism for them defensively, but at the same time, right. these other players you bring in to play those defensive roles who. Really, when you have a roster of 20 playing that night and only three people show up, it's kind of tough to win hockey games. Yeah, and, and I just want to go back to what you said about the dry side of line. I mean, that that last seven minutes was probably the most intense hockey they played in the entire series. I know they did win game two, and the Oilers were in control for most of that game. But really, if we're talking about actually tilting the ice towards the Blackhawks and putting pressure on them, those those last seven minutes when, when they reunited that line who they were probably the best line in the NHL in the season second half last year to have those three back together I mean we, we just saw you can't take those guys apart I, I think finding the right wingers for McDavid will be a goal for this team obviously because you have to have the right guys playing with your franchise center but when you have a line that clicks as well as Nugent Hopkins Yamamoto and Dreisaitl you just can't break those guys up 
No, and that was pretty evident. Yeah, like you said, they were one of the best lines in the league when they got put together. And it was a shame to not see them play together and everything. And even, like, the intensity, like you said, like, wasn't it Nurse who made that hit right as the buzzer sound yeah. came for? And it was like, hey, well, that was probably the biggest hit of the entire series. And you literally left it until the series was over. Like, the game the game was technically over and yeah. you made that hit. And it's just like, man, like, if the Oilers could have just just given it a little bit more, and I guess like there's a few things that went wrong for them, like how many goals went in from like tippings and stuff like oh. that, and deflections, and it's just okay. Well, the goalies didn't make the stops when we needed them to, but also how many times did that happen? So there was just like it just it seemed like it was never going to go their way, no matter what they did, and it was it was such a shame to see it go down like that because it's like you know like I think if you're an Oilers fan, you know the team is actually in a good place and like we have good players and it's just like such an oilist thing to go into that series is like yeah. we like because technically weren't we we were in fourth but dallas had like less games played or something like that so the point uh, per game well the, the oilers right? actually had right the oilers actually had the fourth most points in the western conference but their dallas their point percentage was just slightly ahead of edmonton which knocked them down to fifth in the west and if you think about it, the league has focused so much on divisional rivalries and divisional matchups over the last six or seven years. And the Oilers were the only team that got gypped out of this because if you look back, uh, every other con or every other division in the NHL had, I guess, two teams come from each one. And then it was only the central division that had three teams and one from the uh, Pacific because the Oilers finished se- they finished second in their division and they didn't even qualify for the playoffs they had to play in so I think that that system was flawed I would have went with just the top two teams from each division but uh yeah it's, it, yeah it's I think that would have been a, a fair way I mean they, yeah, also, they had the 12th best record in the entire NHL uh, and you're trying to tell me that 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 team doesn't deserve to be in the playoffs and if you listen to a lot of fans on Twitter right now even from different markets just seeing them talk about what the best team in Canada is, it's you're hearing the the Jets or the Leafs or the Canucks. I think people are forgetting what a great season the Oilers had because it was, I think, what, seven months ago it ended? So hmm. when it's been that long, people are forgetting what a great season they had. They're just focusing on that terrible playoff run. Yeah, and unfortunately, yeah, that's just the way the season's just going to be remembered forever, right? It's like the Oilers couldn't beat the Blackhawks who technically were, weren't a playoff team, I guess exactly. you could call it. <laughs> they, had, they had no hope with, with about 11, 12 games left in the season. They basically had no hope of qualifying for a wild card spot, but that just shows you how important uh, a championship pedigree is, and they still had uh, some of that, although they're going into kind of a rebuilding mode now. Um, I want to switch gears for just a second, though, but yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be talking more Oilers tonight. And uh, uh, just going back to the World Juniors, were you hoping to see any games before COVID hit and kind of forced the tournament to go into a bubble? Yeah, I know my dad and I were looking at, they did like the the lottery thing for the packages that you could right. get and all that. And my, my dad and I were looking into it. It turned out it was a bit too expensive for us to try and go. But uh, we were enough. lucky enough uh, when it was here in Edmonton last time to go to the game. They uh, they played an exhibition game in Sweden. And that was the year Clef Bomb was actually in the tournament. So, it was the 2012 World Juniors, right? Yeah, that was that, yeah. yeah. So, Clef Baum was on the team, I believe, for Sweden. And Sweden, actually, I think they went on to win that year. With okay. Zabinijad, I think, scored the game winner. So Yeah, the, yeah, final. the one yeah. nothing against Russia. Yeah, that's right. So, I was lucky enough to go and see that one game. I think Griffin Reinhardt? No, that might have been too early for him. No, I, I, think, I think you're right. I think he, he was I on think, that team. I think he might have been on that team. Yeah, there was a couple of guys who were pretty good. I can't honestly can't think of any names right now, but well, I was looking up to go to that name to that game. Yeah, and that was pretty cool to go to. And yeah, unfortunately, we weren't going to go to any this year, I don't think. But Fair it's uh, it's cool to go and well, see if you can go. I guess. Yeah, I was hoping to come out to at least see one game. If I even if I had to go buy just a single game that someone was selling online secondhand, because um, I I mean I'd love to go for the whole tournament, but. It's a, it's a long time to stay in a hotel, uh, but um, I, I yeah. went to it. I went when it was the in 2009. They had the tournament here in Saskatoon, and that's when mm-hmm. Canada was going for six straight golds. And it was the year after Jordan Everly scored the 
the incredible goal in Ottawa. So this would have been like Christmas 09 leading into January 2010. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that was, and, and he scored, I think, six goals in the tournament. And I got to see him score, I think, two against Switzerland in a uh, regular, uh, in a round robin game. So that was an awesome moment to get to see one of the Oilers' top prospects at the time. Taylor Hall was also on the team. So there was a, a he hadn't been drafted by Edmonton yet, though. Uh, so yeah, I was hoping after uh, a decade to get to come see some World Junior games again and. Uh, I'd like to come out next year because Edmonton is going to have it again next Christmas. And with <laughs> with all due uh, luck, we'll, they'll be able to fill the building. And uh, I think that's a big reason why they picked Edmonton because they know that although the tournament does fairly well in Europe too, uh, it does so much better when they have it in Canada. Yeah, it's just everything's a lot more fun to have the World Juniors going on when it's in Canada and you can... Like the New Year's Eve game when they usually play Russia or the US or wherever it yeah. is. And you can go over with your buddies, watch the game, and then celebrate the New Year. Hopefully with a Canadian win, but sometimes <laughs> that doesn't always happen. But yeah, just like it's a good time to just watch the games oh. when it's like a relevant time. Like I remember when they were over, they must have been over in Russia, I think. Uf- Ufa, or Ufa was it, or something like that. And the games were at like... Three o'clock yeah. in the morning. It's like, oh, I don't think I'll be staying up for these ones. <laughs> sometimes it's kind of fun. Like when, if the games start early in the morning, sometimes it's, if if you're up that early, it's cool to watch them. But uh, more often than not, TSN just rebroadcasts it at seven p.m. Eastern time the following day. So, uh, if you can avoid hearing the score all day, that, that can be challenging. But then you can kind of treat it as a live game later that night. Yeah, I remember when Canada was actually in the Olympics when uh, I think it would have been Sochi, which was 2014, and they won. I remember staying up for that game for the gold medal game, and I think they beat Sweden like 3 or 4 nothing. And I remember that going into it, there was actually quite a lot of people like, oh, can Canada get it over? Like, Sweden are pretty good. And it's like, well, Canada are also pretty good, and they they obviously proved it. But yeah, sometimes staying up for those games can be uh, can prove pretty fun too. Well, I think the one that everyone's looking forward to is the 2022 Olympics. They will be in China, and I guess we're going to have to see how the world looks, you know, 14, 15 months from now to sort of see if if those games are able to still happen. Although I know the players really wanted that when they did their last CBA negotiations. So if they are able to go, uh, the games uh, over there will be, I think there's a 17-hour time difference between there in western canada so it it could make for some very early games as well but i think those are the ones that people won't mind waking up for because i mean just thinking about the roster off the top of my head and and who canada could have this this could be one of the most talented team candidates we've seen in a long time yeah like it'll be the first time we've seen mcdavid at the olympics and i think mckinnon too right so there'll be so much Carter Hart in goal too. If he'll probably be there, he's you know what? He's asleep. got a chance. He might be the starter. You never know. And 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 I'm really excited to see Crosby with McDavid because these two guys have never played together before. And uh, I always think back to the '87 Canada Cup and the way that uh, Wayne Gretzky kind of was a mentor for Mario Lemieux and taught him how to become a winner. I think that having Crosby sort of take McDavid under his wing and, and do the same thing. It won't just pay off at the Olympics, but he'll be able to take that experience with Crosby back to Edmonton. Yeah, for sure. Hopefully, McDavid can be a winner before 2022 as well. But yeah, well, they, you know, yeah, if we the get, fingers if we get the cup this year, you know, um, yeah. hey, I'd I'd take a, I'd take a deep playoff run. But uh, if they can if they can win a cup uh, this year, that'd be awesome too. Uh, but before we go any further, just like to find out a little bit more about your background and how you got interested in the game. So uh, if you could just tell me, um, when did you first become a fan of hockey and who helped you get into the game? How did you get drawn to it? Uh, I would say my first time being like a hockey fan, I would say, is it probably wasn't until 2010, which seems like kind of late in my life. But so I'm originally from England. So basically what happened was, I lived here in 2007 for a little bit with my family, and then we chose to move back. But before we left, we went to a couple of uh, Sherwood Park Crusaders games in the Alberta Junior Hockey League. So we went to a few of those games, and that kind of piqued my interest, and then went back to England. And the league there isn't isn't the best, but the team we cheered for, I guess you could say, they were called the Manchester Phoenix. So 
Okay. They were terrible. They played. They were. <laughs> they were awful. They. They were last every year. Like they. They were so bad. They. I'm pretty sure they made their own league, with equal okay. competition for them, so that they could start winning games. <laughs> oh jeez. So then, uh, I we eventually made our way back here in 2010, and then, I the first game I really paid attention to was. Well, sorry, the first team the Oilers had was like when they first drafted Taylor Hall, and they had all like. Everly, uh, Magnus Piavi uh, was on the team, like the young kids, and the kid line or whatever you want to call them. And yeah. I remember that preseason Piavi got a hat trick. I remember Piavi. it too. Right? Yeah. And I thought, wow, this guy's going to be the best thing ever. And then <laughs> I knew absolutely nothing about hockey. Like the, the most I knew about hockey was me and my buddy, um, Luke, who actually played for the Show Park Crusaders too. And he played for Humboldt in the Saskatchewan League. And then um, mm-hmm. They, we used to sit in my basement and we used to play NHL 2K7 and we used to, used to build these super teams with like Scott Niedermeyer and like Joe Thornton and Joe Sackick, all the guys, and just go around on NHL and just kill every team that we played against. <laughs> and then that was like the only players I really knew. And then, yeah, we came here, Piavi scored a hat trick and then Emily scored that goal against Calgary uh, in the home season opener. And I was like, man, the Oilers wow. are going to be the best team ever. And then it was, it didn't quite go as planned for that. But yeah, ever since then, I just kind of just loved the game. Like for the last four or five years now, I've worked in a media, I guess you can call it. For I've worked for the AJHL League, being a writer for them. I run below the ice with uh, Tyler Remchuk, who's on TSN 1260. And we do a lot of AJHL coverage on there. And I worked with Dub Network for a couple of seasons or one season with the Oil Kings, which was last year. And that was a lot of fun being able to sit at the top of Roger's place and watch hockey games and then go talk to the players after. So my my passion for the game has has grown quite a lot. And I think a big part of it is is like I'm a big I'm a big soccer fan too. Or was, I guess. Like in England, obviously that's not a big sport, but moving here, that kind of changes a little bit so I kind of this was the sport I latched onto and I I love it it's such a such a unique sport like it's it's weird to think that these guys running around on blades and they can just punch <laughs> each other in the face like it's you yeah. would have thought that would be a sport especially for someone who's uh new to the game when you were in and obviously uh I mean hockey I think it still has somewhat of a presence in England but obviously not as much I, I've had a guest on this podcast a couple times named Sam Hargreaves, and he's from Sheffield. And he's a big fan of the Sheffield Steelers over there. So he's provided some insight on what the the UK Elite League is like. Um, it sounds like they're going to be in a bit of a tough situation if they're not able to have a season this year, just because I don't think they have uh, a TV deal that would be able to keep the league going. They, they basically need uh, fans to they be in fans, the seats. Yeah. Exactly, which is what a lot of the junior leagues, you know, really rely on too, as I'm sure you know. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, just when you mention those two memories, that that you know, I I can picture those two games so perfectly too. And I think most uh, fans who were watching the team at that at that time do. Um, I I remember I was in my dorm room in Calgary when I was going to university in 2010 when uh, Pyarvi scored that hat trick, and then. I was flying home to Saskatoon for Thanksgiving weekend when Everly scored that goal. I was watching it at uh, at a restaurant slash bar in the Calgary airport, and I was the only person in the entire place who cheered <laughs> when Everly scored that goal. So I think it was, you know, that's not a popular team to be cheered for, even in the airport there. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> that was a uh, no. That was one of my favorite goals, and uh, even if I was the only one there that was, that was excited about it, it was still one that I'll I'll never forget. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely something. So if you started following the Oilers around 2010, they were already in the midst of the decade of darkness when when you kind of joined the fandom. Um, w- was it hard to stick with them through those years or because you didn't have any previous ties to the team? Was your allegiances pulling you in any other directions? Uh, no, I don't think so. I've kind of, I always like to cheer for the local team. Like when I, when I lived in England, the soccer team I cheered for was called the Bolton Wanderers and they were, they weren't very good either. They, they were kind of, they were in the Premier League for a while and they kind of lingered around. So it was kind of like, I was kind of used to watching a losing team, I guess you could say. And I was kind of, I just, I don't know. I guess I'm a loyal guy to my sports <laughs> teams. I'll stick by them. And 
I don't mind watching them lose as well. I, I obviously mind watching them lose, but it's like not something that's going to like force me away. I think it just it makes you more passionate for the team. Like you want to you want to see them win and like I, that cup run. They not even the cup run when they went on the playoff run a couple of years ago. That was awesome and just like oh, seeing yeah. like how how much how bad it was for so long and just like you're watching them lose after a year and then it's like next year's our year oh we got this new guy and it's like oh new coach yep. it's okay well now we're gonna be great oh, again and how many new again. coaches <laughs> yeah honestly every year and it's just like now i'm just glad to see the team has got some like stability in it like i think Tippett and holland are gonna do a good job of like two good hockey minds who it doesn't look like they're gonna do anything too crazy to like blow the team up and like send them in a bad direction, but just like, add to the team where they need oh. to not making any crazy signings. And it's, it's good to see that there's that, that stability now that like so long we haven't had. I love the patience from Holland and I love that Tippett, you know, uh, he wants guys to earn it. He doesn't just hand anyone anything. And I think that'll be a thing with Jesse Pugliarvi coming back to the team this year, you know, he, the right side is wide open. There's a chance he could end up on the first line, but uh, no promises are made. He has to come in and earn everything. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that maybe years ago wouldn't have happened because they had such a habit of throwing all these talented young players right into first line duty almost off the start. And a lot of times they struggled because these kids were like trying to basically swim in the deep end and go up against legitimate power forwards from other Pacific division teams. And they were just getting, this is was still even in the era when, you know, size and, uh, and physicality mattered so much when, when they would just get like cycled into the ground. And yeah, it was, <laughs> I don't have to tell you what the decade of darkness was like. You, you know how, <laughs> I mean, obviously a hall and Eberly had their great moments, but the supporting cast around them and the fact that they were thrust into those key roles so early, I'd, I don't think that, you know, was probably beneficial for them. No, I don't think so either. And, yeah, like the physicality, like you said, like you had those L.A. Kings teams, Dust, San Jose uh, was always a Anaheim physical Ducks, team. Ducks, basically Anaheim. all the California, yeah, all those California Vancouver teams. Yeah, too was also big too with like yeah. Burroughs, Bieksa, Kessler, and it's just like, yeah, well, we're just going to get smacked around all night hopefully we can get a goal and yeah no, no kidding yeah <laughs> Not, nothing like devoting three hours to a tuesday night game in february where they lose six to two but well, yeah. there was a there was a lot of that over the decade and i mean I, I i always say you know everything before connor was worth it to get connor so mm -hmm. i try not to uh feel too bad about everything that happened in the nine years between the 2006 Stanley Cup final and getting him in the 2015 NHL entry draft because uh, even if that was brutal I'd go through it all again if it meant you're getting Connor McDavid so with with him at the helm and now Dreisaitl emerging as one of the best players in the league I, I think they are you know really headed in the right direction uh, just to kind of wrap up on the Oilers do, do you have a couple favorite players from when you were first getting into the game I know we talked about some they're like uh, the the Pyarvi moment and and uh, obviously Everly's goal, but just a couple of your favorite uh, Oilers players from when you were first getting into it. And do you have one or two favorite Oilers memories? Yeah, I would. I always have been a fan of Taylor Hall. Like he was the guy that like when I when I was a fan, he was the guy. Like when I started yeah. being a fan, so I think he'll always kind of have, like a soft spot with me. But like I don't know. I guess there wasn't too many like guys who was like, oh, ha Alice Hemsky was a lot of fun to watch. I never really got to see like prime Alice Hemsky, but Love I was a, uh, yeah, I was lucky to be at his last game, played oh, Ottawa. Really? Yeah, and yeah, I think they won goals. five two or five. Yeah, he scored two goals, and I was sat like section three hundred, two seats <laughs> away from the back, like way up there. You, I was so high you couldn't even see the the scoreboard properly. And then they <laughs> traded him to Ottawa the next morning. The, the next day, yeah. Like, he basically got packed his bags, got on the bus with them, it seemed like. so. What an underwhelming I, return, too. I think they only got a third and a fifth round pick for him, which is like, ugh. This yeah, guy was basically our was franchise player for the last seven years. And, ugh, it's just... But that's how it goes, right? Yeah, exactly. And even, like, when Peter got traded, too. Like, I remember seeing the TSM yeah. board, like, three or four on there, and we got... What was it, a second and a fifth or something like that? And now he's regarded yeah. as one of the best defensemen in the league. So, well, that's, that's a kick in the teeth. 
But I mean, yeah, I, I couldn't believe they got rid of Petrie, especially when they knew that they were heading into a rebuild and could get McDavid. I think they could have used a guy like Petrie those first couple of years that he was in the league. Yeah, I would agree. And I guess like another player I like, I this is a bit of a weird one, but I I liked Yakupov's passion. He sucked, but yep. I liked like the passion he brought to the team. Like I remember that goal, like goal he scored against the Kings, was it when he like slid to center ice or whatever like yeah that's that's so ridiculous it was you know what it was cool to see like someone actually care for the team you know like and i feel like the team hadn't really had someone like that for a while and again i want to reiterate he was not good for us (laughs) by any means apart from you know what he he led exactly he led the team in goals in his rookie year and that was basically the height of his production at the nhl and i don't know if you saw this but he actually got traded for money today in the khl so Did he really, yeah, it. and I think this is the second time he's been traded for something other than a, a another player coming back. So when you're when you're basically getting traded for you know uh, a cash amount, it, it probably isn't uh, uh, too promising for your career. But he, I saw a highlight reel assist that he made the other day too. So uh, I think he still has some game in him. It's just a matter of maybe putting it all together. It, it's hard to believe he's 27 now. I, I just feel like he was. 18 yesterday so it, it just shows you how quick uh um it, it's been or how quick it's gone since he first arrived in edmonton but he was a popular player man people can say now that they didn't like yak or that he was a bust or whatever but i remember when they first drafted him i went to a game in 2013 and i saw yakupov 64 jerseys everywhere like he was a popular guy in oil country yeah, he really was, and like people can call him a bust or whatever, but like I think if you go back and look at that draft class, wasn't it like Yakupov, Ryan Murray, Galchenyuk, and who was the yeah. fourth? I can't remember. And uh, Riley, Griffin Reinhardt. But... Griffin. Uh, yeah, there you go. I was think Riley Reinhardt? was. Yeah, I think Riley so. was fifth to Toronto in 2012. Yeah, and I that... think he's like the only good player in the top ten. Maybe Dumbo <laughs> was top ten too. But it's like, that was uh, I think, Phil, I think draft Philip draft. Forsberg went twelfth. That's right. So yeah, it just shows you. Like I think he's. If I'm not mistaken, he's the leading scorer from that draft class. So, you know, to think the Oilers could have had him, but even Forsberg, it, like he's he's a good player. He's not a he's not an elite player though. No, I wouldn't I wouldn't put him as a first overall pick. I don't think he's ri- I you know maybe Morgan uh, Riley you Morgan. Could, you could Ra- you could Morgan, you could justify Morgan Riley as a first overall pick. I mean he's a he's a top pairing defenseman on the Leafs and probably. Uh, at his best, maybe top five or six, seven defensemen in the league a couple of years ago. So, yeah, I, I think you could make a case for Riley being that uh, that level of a player. But at the time, I don't think anyone was thinking about him. It would, I never saw the hype in Murray either. But anyway, I, I would say that 2012 draft is probably one of the weakest, if not the weakest, of the past decade. So, yeah, for sure. like, I, like I said, I try not to worry about anything that happened before, Connor. You know, we got dry sidled the year before. That was that was probably the best actually. The fact that you know we had three first overall picks in the early two thousands on Edmonton, and of, while those three first overall picks were you know exciting at the time, Drysital third overall in twenty fourteen and McDavid first overall in twenty fifteen. Like to get those guys in back to back drafts, like how can you ask for anything more than that? That was just phenomenal. Looking back now, definitely. And we're and we're just still seeing the uh, the start of these guys. I don't even think they've reached their their prime yet. I mean, Drysaddle's turning twenty five later this month, so uh, I think we're going to start to get to see close to his full potential in the next year or two. But Connor is still trending that way, and yeah, just awesome to kind of hear a little bit about your background in in hockey and how you uh, fo- started following the team. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's been it's been a long road for the Oilers fans, but we're heading in the right direction, so there we go. For sure. And just, I wanted to quickly ask you, you said that you started following hockey around 2010 when you came over. Uh, how old were you around that time, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, 14. I would have been 14. Okay. So it's, yeah. I mean, not, yeah, it's probably a little later than some people, because I guess, you know, if you grow up in Canada, you're probably following it at like seven or eight, right? But um, yeah. But yeah, at 14, I think you obviously you've made up for lost time considering you now work in the hockey industry and that you scout and everything. So I'm glad it's going good for you, man. Yeah, things are going well. Thanks. It was kind of funny when I when I left her in 07, that was right after Ryan Smith got traded too and oh. we just lost in the cup. So it was kind of like 
very mixed emotions for Oilers fans at that point. So yeah, yeah, but yeah, here we are you know, now. <laughs> I'll I'll tell you one last quick story about that day. Uh, I had I had uh, faked sick from school that day for trade deadline day, and this I was in grade twelve, uh, and. I stayed home in the morning and I was going to go back in the afternoon for the classes just because I had, it, it had gotten to the point where Smith hadn't been traded and I felt, you know, safe going to school. Like, oh, okay, well, nothing's going to happen. I'm not going to miss anything. And this is before I had a cell phone even. So I couldn't get any updates or anything. And then my dad picked me up after school. And as soon as I got in the car, he broke the news to me that Ryan Smith had been traded. And it was just, oh, crushing man heartbreaker just my <laughs> my my favorite uh my favorite player growing up i was so lucky i got to interview him about uh three three years ago uh mm-hmm. when i was when i was working for the tv station in lloyd minster so awesome guy too everything that you would think about smitty and hope that he would be he, like he's that good of a guy so yeah it just kind of reinforced why he was my hero growing up yeah, I've been able to bump into him a couple of times at the ring. Oh, have just you? At, like showcases and stuff like that. Yeah, he was a. I think he still is. He's a part owner of the Spruce Grove yeah. Saints. Well, that's so, when I. That's when I met him. He was. It was a neutral site game, uh, and it was a uh, game between the, the Saints. At, pardon me. Was I in Wainwright? It was. Yeah, that's right. I yeah. remember that game. That's where I did the interview. It was. It was January of 2018. And mm-hmm. yeah, it was the game between um, uh, the Fort McMurray Oil Barons, I believe, and yeah, and, 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 the, and the Saints, Bruce yeah, uh, and and Spruce Grove, yeah. So, yeah, it was uh, it was such a cool experience, man. And they they drove him out onto the ice in a military tank and everything. It was uh, <laughs> yeah, it was it was awesome. Uh, I I like that idea of doing neutral site games in those communities. I I hope the AJHL does that even more to reach out to their uh, their fans and try and grow the game even more. Because I, I you know the WHL gets so much coverage, but uh, I think sometimes the leagues like the SJ and the AJ don't always get the the top headlines. You know. Yeah, for sure. Just on the neutral site things, and I'll let you. I'll let you carry on with moving on. But uh, there was, uh, do you know, Jeff Boy Whitker? He played for the Oilers for a little bit, or the, yep. or the Roadrunners, I think. Yeah. Well, he's from uh, Vermilion, which is right outside of Lloydminster, right? So um, we, he's like a hero there. Like um, the Shore Park Crusaders had a neutral site game there against Bonneville. This was two, three years ago now, and the entire rink was packed and they had this banner in the corner like a jeff boy wicker banner when he played in uh i think it was when he was at the world juniors in 2002 with one or somewhere around there and the whole ring when they introduced him just went crazy and he was like such a cool moment to be there to like witness this town like have this guy come back and he's just like man that was really that was really cool and i'm sure there was something similar to like when smitty was in was in wainwright like those people out there don't get the the games like that so when they do get them it's just such a crazy crazy atmosphere and it's like something i think like you should experience if you can't if you're like a local if you're a junior hockey fan i think you should kind of experience something like that it was cool for sure oh definitely and if i'm not mistaken uh boy wick uh, he he was property the oilers when like you said when he, when he played for the the road runners but um i if i'm not mistaken i think they got him in the trade for Chris Pronga, I think. You know, well, they sent him in the Chris Pronga trade, but I, I think they acquired him in the trade for Mike Comrie. That's right. Yeah, it mistaken. was to Mike Comrie. Yeah, for and sure, so, that was right. So he never actually played a game for the Oilers, but he was involved in two pretty notable Oilers trades in their history: uh, the yeah. Mike Com- the Mike Comrie trade in '03 and the Pronger trade in '05. So, yeah, he uh, his his name is definitely uh, in in Oilers lore to some amount, but uh, yeah, without without sure. ever funny, actually man. playing for them. Yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, I'd like to get your take now on uh, uh, a couple of the Oilers' newest prospects. They had uh, the obviously the NHL draft just uh, just under two weeks ago, and uh, the Oilers didn't have a lot of draft picks this year. They had a high draft pick, which was a result of as we talked about their poor finish in the playoffs. Uh, they were, I think, they were originally slated to pick twentieth overall, and because they lost in the play-in round, that increased to 14th overall. And because Holland had traded away the second-round pick to Detroit in the Athens-CU trade this year's and next year's, 
they they were kind of in a tough spot. Plus, of course, the James Neal situation. They they traded a conditional third, which even though the NHL uh, decided in their infinite wisdom that the Oilers should have to give up that third round pick, despite Neal not reaching the 20 goal standard that he had to get to for the trade to for it to, supposed to go through. Um, you know, they had to give up a third round pick, which they opted to give up next year's as well. Uh, er, uh, to send it to next year instead, I should say. But yes, they traded down with that third round pick to get a fourth and fifth. And I really like the forwards they took this year, Liam. Uh, and I, I want to get a thought from you on each of them. Let's let's start with Dylan Holloway. I know that this guy's been out of the AJHL uh, for over a year now. But uh, what have you seen or heard from this guy when, when he did play those uh, two years with the Okotoks Oilers? Yeah, well, I know when he was on the Okotoks Oilers team, he was probably their best player, and they were they were pretty dominant. I know in his last year, they finished first in the league. They had like a 20, I think it was like 22 or 23 game win streak. Like they were, I thought they were going to win. They actually ended up losing to Ryan Smith's Spruce Grove Saints. And, uh, <laughs> but he was, he was phenomenal to watch. He's just a very, very well-rounded player. Like he's super reliable. And I think he scored like 40 goals that season. So he like can put the puck in the net and, I know both both these line mates he played with ended up getting drafted into the NHL too, and I'm pretty sure like he helped out pretty significantly with that. I know Austin Wong went to Winnipeg in the seventh round. He's now at um, Harvard. I think this will be his second year, third year now. And then there's also uh, Quinn Olson, who went a third or fourth round in the 2019 draft to uh, the Boston Bruins, and he's at Minnesota Duluth now. So he was a uh, he was on a pretty special Okotoks team, and he really help them elevate that to another level. And uh, the year before, that would have been his, his 16-year-old season because he's kind of playing a year a year ahead, I think, than everybody. Yeah. Because he's an 01, right? Yeah, so 17 season, whatever it may be. And he was a point-per-game player then, too. I think he had, like, 13 or 14 goals. And, again, that team was really good, and he was one of the best players. And then I saw him at the Halinka Gretzky when he was in Edmonton. And... um he was the only player on the team that his draft year wasn't. So that was when like Dylan Cousins was on the team, Matthew Robertson, and um, a couple of other guys that got taken pretty high that year to Kirby Doc. And um, yeah, he's just he was their thirteenth forward and kind of played his way into the lineup. I think he ended up being like a middle six guy, kind of on the wing in the center wherever they needed him. It's kind of like a Swiss Army knife for them. Like whatever situation they wanted him, he could be on there. And I think that just shows like what kind of player he is, if he can work his way on from being a 13th, 14th forward to being on this team where the guys are going in top five of the draft. And yeah, he went 14th overall the year later, but like, I guess he wasn't supposed to, probably wasn't even supposed to be on the team and managed to work his way on. And yeah, I think the Oilers, I think the Oilers just got themselves a pretty, a pretty good player with the 14th overall pick, despite what maybe some people won't say, won't say about him. Right. And I mean, admittedly, I didn't know a lot about the player before they took him. Uh, I think a lot of fans in oil country were really hoping to get uh, Seth Jarvis from the Portland Winterhawks. And he just seemed like such a skilled, offensive-minded player that would fit in so well with this young core. And I had a list of about three or four guys who I was really hoping the Oilers were going to take. Holloway wasn't even in my top five. But um, just looking at his numbers, I mean, you were right. He was a point-per-game player as a 16-year-old. Uh, and the following year, like you said, 40 goals and 88 points in his, in his final season as a 17-year-old before obviously going to the University of Wisconsin this past year. But uh, it looks like the talent is there. Uh, he didn't produce as much in uh, Wisconsin this year, and I think part of that is because he was on a, a fairly good team and also being so young, maybe the opportunities weren't there to come by. However, he did get nine points in his last 10 games. So it looked like he was starting to turn it on at the end of the year. But uh, I appreciate getting some insight from you because I really hadn't followed this guy. And I, I know that he plays sort of in the AJHL South, right? So you don't see him maybe as often, but um, yeah. uh, but still a, a good power forward. And, do you, do you see him fitting in more at the NHL as a center or a winger? Um, I think he could. I think he can kind of be that guy wherever you need him. To be honest, like I saw a, I saw a, a comparison. 
that was uh, Jordan Stahl, maybe that kind of guy for the Oilers. And I mean, like, if he ends yeah. up being Jordan yeah. Stahl, that's a pretty good player I'll to get. That. And even, um, I know Jason Greger on TSN here in Edmonton, he was saying his, like, low end is like a, a Marty Reisner, which people might kind of raise yeah. their eyebrows at. But, like, Marty Reisner played 800 games in the NHL and, like, had a yep. pretty good career. And, I mean, if that's the kind of player you get in who's going to produce 800 games, I mean... That's That'd a pretty, pretty good, good pick. Yeah, like I think everyone just kind of assumes that all these first round picks need to be the next superstar on the team. It's like, well, no, not necessarily. Like, as long as they can like contribute to the team in like a a productive manner, then it doesn't really, you know, as long as you're not the first overall pick and you just, you know, yeah. getting twenty points a season. <laughs> but I think yeah, I think Holloway could be a productive player on the wing or at center. And by the sounds of it, the Oilers were kind of open to either idea. Right. And I think that there is this expectation, especially in Edmonton, because we've seen so many uh, elite high end players get drafted in the first round over the last decade as a result of finishing near the bottom of the league, uh, that that's sort of the expectation now of every pick. You look at last year, they picked Philip Broberg when everyone seemed to want Cole Caulfield or Trevor Zegras. And, you know, I was in that camp. But uh, fast forward a little over a year and look how well Broberg is performing in the Swedish league. So it, it just kind of shows you that sometimes we don't know as much as the the guys who actually are picking these players know. I think Ken Holland has a better sense of what these players are going to be than than we ever could. And obviously we're starting to see the fruits of that. And it's only one year in. I, I, you know, Broberg's going to develop so much over the next decade. But Holloway, another player with a mixed reviews this year and uh it, it's like you you kind of talked about that maybe he will just settle into being a, a really good third line center i think the upside might be uh, a top six winger but then yeah. again like i said this is only from what i've been able to learn from him in the last two weeks it's not like i've studied this player uh throughout the year so i'm, I'm hoping to get a, a few uh, uh see him a few more times uh, this year maybe he'll make the world junior team Maybe uh, he'll take a step forward at Wisconsin. That'll that'll be what I'm looking forward to watch. But yeah, if yeah, and I sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I am. Um, he's the kind of guy that, like, like we said, like before, he scored 40 goals in a season. He's not like he's coming coming into Wisconsin as like a third line checking, second line checking forward, whatever on his junior team. Like this guy was the guy on his team. Like he can yeah. produce all this and like. I know a lot of people, like, you named a couple of players before that were on his team, like Caulfield and Takah, and I, there was a couple other guys, right. too. That team was stacked, and, like, the fact they didn't do as good as they did, and, like, I think you could see, like, just to go on Wisconsin for a quick second, like, you were saying Holloway had nine points in his last ten games. To me, that shows his team is, like, clicking, in a way. Like, maybe they're not getting the wins, I'm not quite sure, but... If that can kind of help them and they're getting a bit of momentum and like chemistry together, like it's only going to help Holloway next season when or whenever they get to play. So that's really good for them. And yeah, I think Holloway, like I do believe he has upside to be a top six guy for the Oilers. And worst comes worst case scenario, he's hope well, hopefully he's a third line center. Of yeah. Worst case, you know. So yeah, I think overall, like the Oilers got a good player. And one thing I really like about the pick is that he's an NCAA player. I, I love the NCAA compared to, like, the CHL just because I think it gives players more time to develop. Like, I like the idea of only having games on the weekends and then you have more practice time where in the WHL or wherever it may be, maybe you're driving from M Edmonton to Prince George on a Tuesday where Dylan Holloway's in the gym. You know, I think it makes a yeah. big difference in kind of development. And I, I really like that the others seem to be kind of trending in that direction with some of the picks we've got. And we saw it this year, too, with, I think, three guys from the NCAA. Yeah, and the Oilers have picked guys from the college system in the past, too. And um, maybe the best one in the last 15 years was Andrew Cogliano. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, they've. Uh, I, I think that Holloway, if he could turn out to be as good of a player as, as Cogliano was, you know, that, that would, you know, be great for the team as a third line center behind McDavid and Dreisaitl. It's just, it's going to take this kid some time. He's, you know, he's just turned 19. I don't think they need to rush him. He's probably going to spend at least another year or two in college and then probably a full season in Bakersfield and maybe come up halfway through the next season. So I don't think we're going to see him in Edmonton for about three or four years. How about you? Yeah, I would agree. And I think I think Oilers fans need to be okay with that happening. Like we don't, 
we don't need this 19 year old kid to come and join the team next season or we've even seen that enough the after. <laughs> yeah like even Yamamoto, like, look at Yamamoto. Everyone thought we should have traded him. And, like, I was one of those guys who was like, oh, is this guy ever going to kind of turn into what we want him to be? And now we were just talking at the start, like how he was part of one of the best lines in the league, and he's, everyone loves him. Point-per-game player. I know it was a small sample size, but he was a point-per-game player, uh, you know, in the second half of the year. So, yes, playing with Dry Seidel and Ryan Nugent Hopkins obviously helps. But he, it's not like he was the third man on that line that was kind of dragging them down. He was, you know, clicking with them, setting up nice plays constantly. He was a major contributor to that line. Yeah, definitely. Like you said, like big, big contributor to the line. And without him, like maybe Drysaddle doesn't get the heart. Like maybe he doesn't right. get that extra goal that helps him, you know. And like, I think it's fair to say that that line was like equally produced and like contributed pretty equally, I would say. Definitely. So let's move on now, uh, talking about the Oilers' next draft pick. So as I kind of talked about going into this, there was a long gap between the Oilers' first pick and their second pick due to trading away several picks. And I love the move that Holland did to take that third-round pick that they decided to retain instead of sending it to Calgary this year and ship it to San Jose for their fourth and fifth-round picks. So ultimately, the Oilers gave out the 76th overall pick and got back the 100th and 126th pick. <clears throat> and I like the guys they got with both of them. Carter Savoy at 100th overall and Ty Tulio at 126th overall. Both of these guys were seen as second-round talents. And be- getting them in the fourth and fifth round, this has the potential, and w- I don't know if it's going to get there or not, but it has the potential to be like in 2015 when Edmonton got... Ethan Bear in the in the fourth round, or sorry, I should say Caleb Jones in the fourth round and Ethan Bear in the fifth round. So if they can steal a couple talented young forwards late in the draft, they are going to be looking a lot better down the road because this team is desperate for skilled players. And, and it sounds weird to say when you have McDavid and Dreisaitl on your roster, but it really is true. They need a second wave of talent to support their their high end guys, and this is. This is the kind of picks that you do it. So I know you uh, have followed Carter Savoy uh, a decent amount. I'd like to get your take on him before I say anything. Yeah, well, I think for anyone who just looks... Oh, sorry, the back of my mic fell out there. So, uh, um, I still I got would, you. <laughs> I would just say Carter Savoy, it's the best way to describe him as a goal scorer. Like, I think you can And they see... need goal scorers. Exactly. And I mean, the fact they got this kid at 100th overall is... Is crazy. I think the only player in the draft who scored more goals in Savoy this year was Seth Jarvis, and I think he had 54. But he might have played a few more games too. Like Savoy, he's such a fun player to watch, and he's he comes up big in like the big moments too. Like there was a time this year. So I guess for anyone who doesn't know, the Show Park Crusaders were historically a very mediocre team in the AJHL, fifth, sixth, fourth position, never really getting over the hump, and then. The last couple of years when Savoy came in and also Michael Benin, who was Matthew Benin's brother, he actually went 95th overall to Florida. Those guys kind of helped change the franchise and put them in a different direction. And then they were chasing titles. And this past year, they were the number one team in Canada. And I think the, it was November time they played the Brooks Bandits, who, which is where Kale McCaw came from. And uh, Brooks are one of the better teams in the in the league and in, in Canada, to be honest, and have been for a while. And all eyes were on that game, saying, like, are the Crusaders going to be, is this the real, like, are they the real deal? And Savoy came out and scored a hat-trick. He was phenomenal. Like, he scored two two goals, I think, on the breakaway, and then one, he kind of, like, made space for himself on the back post and just fired it in. And he came up big in a lot of games. He had a hat-trick against Spruce Grove, and he doesn't just score, too. Like, he makes his line mates really good as well. Like, he had a couple of good line mates, Arjun Atwal, who... Spent time in the WHL with Saskatoon and Williams Apenick, who's now at um, the University of Vermont, which I believe Jay Woodcroft's brother is the head coach there. There's a little Oilers connection. And also oh, now nice. uh, Mike, Mike Babcock, too. So I would say Savoy overall is he just he has really good hockey IQ. Like he knows he knows when he needs to step up and is not. I'm not saying he like slouches down and like the the lesser games, I guess you can call them. Like he shows up to every single game, every shift, and he gives it, gives it his all. And I know, like, there's been some criticism on him. Like his body language looks bad, and like 
But I think at the end of the day, like it's it's you just got to know know what kind of player he is, and like his body language isn't bad. I think he just kind of gets maybe maybe frustrated with himself sometimes. He's like, oh, I wish I could have done something maybe a little better, but I don't think he's like frustrated at anybody else in particular. I don't want to cut you off, but people say the same thing about Leon Dreisaitl, too. Yep. You know, he sometimes slouches his shoulders after a bad shift or when he just misses going top shelf or something. So maybe that's just sometimes how players internalize things and how they how they project it. It, it might not look uh, the best, but, you know, they can talk about yeah. all his, they can talk about his faults all they want. But even if he has one skill, which I don't think he only has one skill, but if that one skill is putting the puck in the net, that's a pretty valuable skill to have. Yeah, ex- yeah, exactly. And I think even with the dry saddle thing, I think like those high end players, they have high expectations for themselves. And if they miss the net by a couple of centimeters, they're going to hold it against themselves. Like, I should have scored that goal. And it doesn't matter if like you get a guy like Leon who scored 50 goals in the NHL, or you get a guy like Savoy who scored 50 in the AJHL. It's like these guys are still the, at their level. They're the best. And I think that was Savoy thing too. And I know one criti- another criticism was his skating, which I always thought was it's not as bad as it seems again. Like I think if it's one of those players you gotta be kind of nitpicky on, I think is a fair way to put it. And he came out in an interview, it might have even been with the Oilers on their YouTube page and I think I, I saw that same one, yeah. Yeah, and he was I've worked on my skating and he's I think he said it like this is the best my skating's been or something along right. those lines. Like I'm he pretty was, sure that's yeah. exactly what he said. Yeah, and, like, he obviously knows his flaws. And, I mean, if he's willing to spend an entire summer working on stuff like that, then that's a good sign. I think this kid obviously knows what he wants to be, and it's an NHL player. And I think the fact that he's from St. Albert, which is just outside of Edmonton, and he's probably cheered for Edmonton his entire life, like, it's got to add a little extra motivation to him. Oh, definitely. I mean, getting a chance to go to your hometown team and and a team that's, emerging with superstars like we've talked about this this is an exciting time to be an oiler now he might also be three to four years away but you know what's kind of funny the oiler fans watching the draft or just paying attention to it either on twitter or uh watching tsn uh it seemed like the holloway pick wasn't that exciting to them because it wasn't the guy that they were really hoping for in the first round but then they get this natural goal scorer in the fourth round and it just seemed like oil country was thrilled to get this kid. And I don't know how many people have watched him. I've personally, I don't think I've ever seen him play. So I'm only going by YouTube highlights. And from what I've read about him in scouting reports, articles, looking at his stats on elite prospects, I was encouraged to see that he was projected to go somewhere between, I think 38th and 50th overall. So he was basically seen as somewhere between an early to mid second round pick. No idea how he fell to the fourth, but you know, uh, the Oilers, they, they could have taken him at 76th and I would have thought that was a good pick based on what I've, you know, come to learn, but getting him at a hundredth, I think that was really good value. Yeah, I think so too. And yeah, I think his final grading was like 52nd or something like that. So, I mean, the fact that Oilers got him almost 50 picks later is pretty, pretty nuts. And I can't, I, not familiar with the name of the amateur scout for the Oilers, but uh, he came out and is like, yeah, we're just going to stash him away in Denver for a couple of years and kind of see how he goes. And I think that's that's the best thing for him. Uh, we can, that's a, I would say Denver is one of the high-end college teams, and now they obviously know what it takes for players to go pro, and he's got a good coaching staff down there that's going to help him develop and get to that next level so he can become a professional hockey player, whether it's, right away to the Oilers or in Bakersfield for a couple of years. Who knows how this kid's going to go? But, like, one thing's for sure, like, Carlos Savoy knows how to put the puck in the net, and he knows how to make players better around him. And I think that's something that could be very valuable for the Oilers. And who knows? Maybe maybe he's the winger that the Oilers are looking forward to play with <laughs> McDavid, a guy who can naturally score. And, I mean, that would be awesome to see. You know, for the longest time, it seemed like Dreisaitl was going to be that guy. And we've come to the point where for the Oilers to get where they want to go, they need to have McDavid and Dreisaitl on separate lines. They can still run wild together on the power play and rack up a million points. But when it comes to playing at five on five, they need to be driving their own lines. And Leon Dreisaitl has proven he can not only drive his own line, but he could be a franchise center on a lot of teams. 
Mm-hmm. And I think his line mates are fairly set. I, I wouldn't touch that line, but if you know, they're going to have to find someone for McDavid in the meantime, but if Savoy can be that guy down the road, you know, watch out because this is a guy who knows how to put the puck in the net and having a guy like that, maybe he can eventually be Connor McDavid's shooter because that's, that's all we, you know, ever hear. Like, when are we going to find McDavid's shooter? Are they going to sign Mike Hoffman? Are they going to get Anthony Declare? Like it's all these, there's constantly, an, uh, you know, a bunch of names out there, but I look at a guy like Patrick Maroon. <clears throat> now, Patrick Maroon is a popular, was a popular player when he played in oil country. But he's, you know, by no means um, a high skill player. But Connor McDavid was able to turn him into a 27 goal scorer in 2016 17. If you're able to put a guy who actually has a lethal shot next to him, sky's the limit, right? Like Savoy, I mean, he could, when he gets to the NHL, there's a chance he, you know, does better than that, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it is pretty incredible, like, how undervalued scoring is. Like, people can be like, oh, all he does is score goals. It's like, well, like, isn't that, like, the most valuable thing in <laughs> hockey? Like, isn't that what you need to do? <laughs> like, so I think, like, the fact Savoy, again, just fell so low and, like, the Oilers were kind of able to snag him. It's, it's pretty cool to see, like, they were able to kind of, like, find a local kid, too, which, again, I think just, just adds to the story. And, yeah, I think... So well, he can he can play with anybody and look good doing it, and I think he can make other people look good. And, and yeah, if like McDavid like needs him to go there and stand on the post and <laughs> hit tappins, like I'm sure he'll love to do that too. And he he played a lot on the power play for the Crusaders this past year too. And I guess you can call it like an Ovechkin kind of role. Like he was he was either on the in the faceoff dot there, or he kind of controlled the power play and distributed quite a bit too. So he's he can kind of be on that power play for you as well down the line. But again, hopefully we can see him in an Oilers jersey in a few years from now and he can develop well in Denver in the meantime. Yeah. I was sort of thinking for him, same thing, two years in Denver and then maybe a year and a half to two years in Bakersfield. And then by then he should be, you know, at 22 years old, ready to step into the Oilers lineup. Yeah, I would say that's a that's a pretty good estimate on the time there too. That I was kind of thinking around that time, maybe two or three years, and yeah, time in Bakersfield should do him good. And then who knows? We'll see what happens after that. So just to wrap up on Savoy, uh, w- compared to the rest of the competition in that league last year, and from what you saw, where would he stand out among the best players? Is he like a top three player in the league? In the uh, in the AJHL last season, yes. Yeah, I would say last season. <laughs> Yeah, like he's got to be a a top three, five player at least. Like there was a couple of guys in there, and he was easily the best goal scorer. Like he scored fifty goals, like we said. And yeah, I would say he was right up. But he actually didn't win MVP from the Crusaders. Arjun Atwal ended up winning the MVP. He had a uh, hundred and I think he had a hundred and ten points or something like that. And like he was just kind of a big guy in that franchise. But yeah, I would say Savoy is easily like top three player in the league and. Yeah, like last season's AJHL was a really good pool of players too. Like if you ever go back and look, there's a lot of players who went to NCAA and a lot of guys who were, well, we, I think the league had six players drafted this year, which is the most it's had in a long time. So like it got a bit diluted this year with just talent going other way. But yeah, I would say it was one of the best league seasons the AJHL has seen in a while. And I would say Savoy was easily a, a top three player, maybe top two. That's awesome, man. And how many times have you actually seen him live, I should ask? Oh, man, like over 100 times. Wow. So yeah, you, do have a, seen... you do have a pretty good scouting report on the kid then. Yeah, I've seen him play quite <laughs> a lot. I try and Sherwood Park's like the local team by me. I, I live right. kind of close by, and I just try and go to AJ Chug, uh games as much as I can, Spruce Grove, Camrose, wherever I can kind of go. But yeah, Savoy. Sherwood Park were a really fun team to watch, and it was uh, – you got to go out and see him, and yeah, it was exciting to watch him play so much, and yeah, just well, a really, just really entertaining kid to watch. <laughs> I'm sure they're going to miss having him and Benning on the team, but they'll both be in Denver this year, and maybe you can keep a couple tabs on what he's doing down there as well. I know I'll be watching them. That's that's going to be the two college teams that I'll be focusing on for probably the next two years is Wisconsin with Dylan Holloway and Denver with Carter Savoy. Definitely, and they've got a lot of other great players too, so they'll, they'll just be fun games to watch overall. Yes, definitely. And I, I think his little brother is currently skating with the team too, isn't that right? Yeah, he's played... Uh, so the AJHL is in like an, a cohort thing right now, 
So the Crusaders are actually playing Lloydminster, and I believe they're okay. just going into game game five or six this next weekend. So he's played he's played four games of them. I think he has four assists. Well, he's off to a good start then for sure. And you know, I that was the team that I covered when I was working at the the television st- station in uh, Lloydminster three winters ago now. So that I, you know, I really enjoyed covering the AJHL there too. I didn't follow it as closely as you did. I was mainly doing like a weekly story on the team, um, basically just sort of off the ice stuff, more talking about, you know, getting to know the players and things like that, but just getting to go down to practices and see them at games. I mean, it, it's a really exciting league. It's good hockey. And, and I, I know people view it as kind of a tier two league, but a lot of these guys are like Savoy. They they could play in the WHL, right? It's mm-hmm. it's not like it's not like he's in the AJHL because that was the height of his abilities. He played there to keep his NCAA eligibility intact. Exactly, and like I mean, people can say that all they want being a tier two league, but I think when you actually go out of your way and watch this, watch some of these kids play, like a lot of players could play in the WHL. Like I know. Even t- well, he had a goalie. There was a goalie in Sherwood Park called Matt Berlin, and he was on. He played in the WHL for a long time. Like he played for Seattle Kootenai, and there was one other team he played for. I can't remember who it was. And he was saying, "Is like because he was on the team two years ago." And I remember doing an interview with him, and he said that uh, he said that like this this team could beat WHL teams. Like they were that they he thought they were that good, and like it shows that like the talent in that league isn't as bad as people make it seem. And like you said, like Savoy isn't there because he couldn't make a a WHL team. He's there because he wants to go and play at Denver and he wants to continue his development there. For sure. And you follow the WHL to a certain extent too, right? Yeah. Like I, last season I was with the oil Kings watching the majority of their games with dub network. And yeah, they had, they had a phenomenal team too. I was, I was pretty lucky last year. I got to watch. Yeah. Dylan Gunther and Jake Neighbors play for the Oil Kings one night, and then I go to the Show Park Arena and watch uh, watch Carter Savoy and Michael Benning play. It was uh, I was quite lucky, and then good. yeah, it all all came to an end all of a sudden. So that's good sucked. timing to have those players. But yeah, I mean, uh, the the Oil Kings should be you know back this year as well. So I I think uh, I think you'll you'll have lots uh, lots more exciting hockey to watch. Uh, I, I should ask you before before we wrap up though. Uh, I'm just thinking of more questions on the spot. How do you think? Uh, how do you think Savoy would have done in the WHL? Like, you know, maybe scoring 50 goals might be a bit of a stretch, but uh, would he be like a 30 goal scorer in that league? I think so, and I think it's based off circumstance for the most part too. Like, I believe his rights were orig- originally with Regina, and then he got traded to Winnipeg. Because they were trying to, they were, like trying, they were trying to reunite to him with his brother, him. right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And obviously, that didn't work out for them. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I think like there's no reason why Savoy couldn't have scored 30, 40 goals in that league. And like again, I just think I think the big thing is circumstances. Like he had a good situation in Shaw Park. He had talented line mates who he was able to build chemistry with. And like Winnipeg has a very talented team too. Like Carson Lambos is going to be a big pick next year for them. His brother would have been there for. 30 games or whatever he played. They had a couple other really good kids. and They have Peyton Krebs, think, right? It was a high pick. Peyton, yeah, exactly, Peyton Krebs. And another kid, Connor McLennan, I think his name was. He was like, he was a high pick in the WHL draft. I believe he went fourth or fifth round this year in the NHL draft. So they were a talented team with a lot of offensive offensive talent in there too. And I mean, like, if you pair him up with Peyton Krebs, what was he, like a top 15 pick in last year's draft yeah, too? So I, I think he went 17th to Vegas, but, you that's know, right, yeah. that, that was sort of in his range. Somewhere around 15th was where he was expected to go. Yeah, so I think you, you put those together and say, okay, well, Savoy could have played with a kid who went in the first round of the NHL draft and he was playing with two really good line mates at Shield Park too. Like, could have. He could have maybe scored 50. Like, who knows, right? Like, that kid, Krebs, Krebs is an NHL prospect. Like, Savoy is good, would have helped him out a lot. And I think I think Savoy would have found very equal success. Maybe not 50, but, like, 40 goals, 30 goals, somewhere like that would have been just, just as good, I think. Well, that's awesome, man. Hey, Liam, I just want to thank you so much for coming on here tonight and talking about these kids. I know that Oiler fans are really interested to hear more about these two young players who, you know, 
most of us haven't had a lot of viewings of. So to get to have some extra insight from a guy who watches them all the time, like you said, watching Savoy a hundred times, we, my, my goodness. Now that's, uh, you might, you might have seen him almost as much as anybody in that region. Uh, you should, you should have asked the Oilers scout if you've seen him as many times as him. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Should have put a bet on there or something. <laughs> but, uh, but before we go, uh, is there anything that uh, you want to promote or where can people find your work? Uh, yeah, so we have Below the Ice, which is a project Tylee Remchuk and I have been working on for a while. And this year we're trying to push to, to, to make the AJHL more of an accessible league, like for people to actually find stories on. So people who, when the Oilers draft Dylan Holloway and Carl Savoy, they can then go and see these kids and find out a little bit more about them. And that's what we're trying to do over there. So I guess if there's anybody interested in in a local town in the AJHL, they can contact me. My Twitter handle is at Liam Horribin. It's fairly easy to find. And give me a shout and we can see what we can work out. And I'm also doing some scouting for Draft Geek for the upcoming WHL Bantam Draft, which will be in April, I think, or May it usually is. So that's getting started now. But yeah, those are like the two main places you can find any of my work. Awesome. And everyone, please go check that out. I'll also tag you in this post when it gets posted on Twitter, as well as the Oilers Live channel, which is run by my buddy Michael. He will also be uh, sending that out. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to get some more people to follow the AJ. And I think that, uh, you know, as these top young players continue to come out of the league, it's only going to get more and more popular. We see it, what Kale McCarr is doing in uh, Colorado right now. And this is a guy who was playing in that league not too long ago. Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of guys, too, that have kind of, the last few years, Kale McCarr, I like to call it the Kale McCarr effect, because since since he's done what he's done, he's really helped put the league on the map. And Seth Bernard Docker was taken the year after him, and he was great at the World Juniors for Team Canada. I'm oh, sorry, Jacob Bernard Docker, Seth's his younger brother. He plays in Okotoks, too, actually. And then Ian Mitchell, who just signed with the Chicago Blackhawks, I think, or is like a high-end prospect with them. And there's, a, there's a ton of guys coming through, and I think it's, it's important that the AJHL and even the other junior A leagues, BC, Saskatchewan, they kind of get some attention too because they're not just, like you said, they're not just guys, they're not just WHL rejects. These are guys you can, can play hockey and can play at a high level too and they deserve to be deserve to be noticed, I think. Well put, Liam. I, I, I just want to say once again, thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, hopefully you'll come back on sometime to talk uh, maybe how these these prospects are doing down the road or just even more to talk about the AJHL and the Oilers. Yeah, I'm I'm good to go whenever you need me. I lo- always <laughs> love talking about the AJ and hockey overall. So, yeah, thanks for thanks so much for having me on. No problem. So for Liam Horbin, I'm Eric Friesen. This has been the 99 Forever podcast. We're out.